worshipped at the feet of man, but found those feet were clay. Till Jesus called out, follow me, and trust all I say, God's word shall stand, God's word shall stand. Alone it towers far above the works of man, God's word shall stand, God's word shall stand. Inspired of God and written by the Spirit's hand. Though hell may rage against it, though Satan lead the way, though he tries to crush our faith and steal our confidence away, God's word remains undaunted, a solid rock of trust. It has never been refuted, so trust it. We must, God's word shall stand, God's word shall stand, fear not. God's word shall stand. God's word is like a lighthouse that stands throughout all time. Its power flows from heaven, for its maker is divine. God's word endures forever, its great light will always shine. By grace alone I live it, and by faith it is mine. God's word shall stand, God's word shall stand. Alone it towers far above the works of man. God's word shall stand, God's word shall stand. Inspired of God and written by the Spirit's hand. Though hell may rage against it, though Satan lead the way, though he tries to crush our faith and steal our confidence away, God's word remains undaunted, a solid rock of trust. It has never been refuted, so trust it. We must, God's word shall stand, God's word shall stand, fear not. God's word shall stand. Fear not, God's word shall stand. Those who create 
criticize and work their evil plans, God's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of men, God's word will stand. word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans. God's word will stand against the gates of We live in a world that is changing Old things seem to need rearranging Have we forgotten where we're leaning On the edge of the unknown? Lord, I fear we're all so used to changing We touch things not needing arranging Till at times we feel like saying Nothing good can stay We say words will come, words will go Words may change their meaning Until we hear a voice that's never changed you can trust my ways I give you my word When I trust your every word I'm showing that I need you With every truth obeyed I'm showing that I heed you And your voice is heard When I trust your every word We still tend to question what you're saying Maybe Stand with me as we sing through uh, Standing on the Promises Which is hymn number 271 for my choir and my uh, musicians up here will sing through all four verses of Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King
tell you what now, that singing with those, without those hymnals, it sounds pretty good. I did see a picture of our hymnals that have been rebound, and they all look brand new. They look really nice. We ought to get them back within the next week, and uh, we'll have them available again. But I'm telling you, I'm leaning toward going both ways. Yeah. You know, I'm really enjoying hearing you sing like that with your face up and snarl on your face. I get to, I get to see that a little bit more clearly. And then when you're looking down at the hymnal, you can't hide that. And anyway, so uh, hopefully we will get those back uh, very soon. But uh, let me take a moment to welcome you to our service this morning. And we're looking forward to a good day in the Lord. Good to see each and every one of you. It's a blessing having visitors with us this morning, and you are welcome and wanted at Midland Baptist Church, and we're glad that you're here. I do want to give you a quick testimony of some of folks who are visiting with us today. Uh, on Tuesday, I received a phone call, maybe about 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it was from a dear lady, and uh, we really talked for a long time, so I've got to shorten this up here for about a minute to about a minute. But... Uh, uh, she was telling me I'd never met them. They'd never been to the church, but they were watching live stream. And uh, they had tuned in quite a bit to the uh, three-part series on Baal. And uh, she talked to me about their, their history in, in a, let, let me just put it this way, a particular church that would maybe qualify for some of that study. And then also uh, some study in the past in Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, other things like that. And she said, Pastor Payne, I want you to know that that material that you gave out on bail in those three messages, you know, we, we went over that time and again. We were able to stop it, start it, go along in the Bible with you. And we want you to know that God has changed our lives. Amen. And um, that uh, we have rededicated ourselves to the Lord. My husband got saved last week, and we're going to be in church Sunday. And they're here today. Amen. And so we thank the Lord for that. And, of course, the people I'm speaking about is Sally Charlton's daughter and son-in-law. And Sally said, you need to listen to this series. And they did. And God uh, used it. And they saw out of the Bible what God had to say about these matters. And thank God for what God's done. Amen. So we rejoice. And we're glad for all of our visitors today. Let's open in prayer. And then you may be seated as our choir ministers this morning. Father, we already are blessed to be here to shake a hand, to give a smile, to sing a song, Lord, to hear a testimony of what you did in the life of this precious couple uh, this past week. And Lord, I pray that the service today would be a blessing to all that are here. Help us to draw near to you in all we do. Lord, we do thank you for the power of God unto salvation. We thank you for the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how that Christ died on the cross for us and how he's buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We pray today, Father, that you would meet with us in an unusual way. Help us to appreciate all that we have in Christ today. May we grow, may we become more conformed to the image of your son. And Lord, at the end of the day, may we just say it was a great day at church. God met with us and Christ was magnified and honored and exalted. And we'll thank you for all you do this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name and we ask it for his sake. Amen. Please be seated.
you for that choir. Aren't you glad we have something we can stand firm upon in a day of just sinking sand? So if you would stand with me, um, and we'll continue with our theme of standing today, and we'll sing out of hymn 477, 477, of, uh, and we'll sing all four verses of Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. We'll start with that first verse and take a moment to greet one another. Again, very good singing this morning. Good to see everyone. And I want to take a moment just again to welcome our visitors to Midland Baptist Church today. And 
We're so glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, we hope you've already found a warm welcome and a, a friendly handshake and smile. We would like to have a record of your being with us today. And so if you're visiting this morning for the first time, or maybe the first time in a really long time, right in front of you in, that, uh, in the back of the pew, you'll find visitors cards like this. And if you would pull that out and fill it out, and then in a moment when the offering plate comes by, if you would drop that in there so that we could have a record of your being with us today, we would greatly appreciate that. And we are, again, grateful that you are here. If you take your bulletin with me for just a moment, share a couple of things for the upcoming, well, couple of weeks. As you open the bulletin, you'll notice on the inside flap is our service times on Sunday and Wednesday. We want to encourage you to be with us as often as your schedule permits uh, to come and to attend. On inside the bulletin, the far left-hand page, we have a listing of our evening services. Today is the fourth Sunday, the last Sunday of the month of March, so we do not have church tonight. What am I doing wrong? Oh, am I supposed to follow this? All right, so I haven't done announcements for a while. I don't want to follow that. Have that follow me. <laughs> well, that's what I just said. All right, read the board. <laughs> Family night, no evening church tonight, all right? What else you got up there? I, see, this is messing me up. Amen. I, I resemble that. Uh, teen Bible study, of course, uh, tomorrow night with college and career Bible study also. N not a lot uh, going on the rest of the week, but next Sunday, of course, is uh, Resurrection Sunday, celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're visiting with us today, you don't have a home church, we would encourage you to come back and be a part of our Easter service. We're at Resurrection Sunday service next Sunday morning. And we would appreciate having you again. Uh, if you drop down a little further, you'll notice April the 7th, we're having the Lord's Supper uh, the uh, first Sunday night of April because next Sunday with the holiday, we're not going to have church next Sunday night either. We're going to let you stay at home with family. So we're going to push the uh, Lord's Supper one week uh, later. And uh, then uh, Prime Timers Amish Lunch uh, April the 8th. Now, here's an announcement about that. Uh, the money for that lunch is due by next Sunday so they can give a good count to the people who are hosting us. And if you're going to be in the van going up there, the van is going to be stopping at the Amish store after the lunch. So keep that in mind for your schedule. And then April the 11th, ladies, it's a ladies' day out to the Freeland Antique Mall. So, does that mean it's just senior ladies then, or? Okay. I don't, I don't. You're welcome. And uh, leaving the church at 9 o'clock in the morning. Sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for all ladies. Men's prayer breakfast coming up April the 13th. You'll want to get that on your calendar, men. And over underneath opportunities, don't forget Friend Day coming up at the end of April. We should have our uh, postcard invitations done hopefully within the next week and get those in your hands so you'll have a whole month to invite people out for that big day coming up April the 28th. I would also remind you that this coming Tuesday is going to be the funeral service for Regina Taylor's dad, Jim Creed, and that's going to be at 11 o'clock at the Smith Minor Funeral Home on Wackerly. And there's visitation from 10 to 11 and an 11 o'clock funeral. So if you're able to come to that and you'd like to come, it is open to everybody to attend. And I'm sure the family would appreciate it if you do come. All right, men, if you'll come, we'll receive our morning giving. Brother Andrew has an announcement. And then uh, pray for the offering. I'll mention this too. Uh, a couple announcements from me. Number one, we um, these were sold out last time. These anchor Bible maps by Brother Gerard um, were sold out. So if there's something that you wanted to get a hold of, 
Um, JL has brought some more, so they're $20, just a good study resource um, for that. Um, I did send the sign-up link out for Spring Retreat. That'll be April 19th through the 21st, so please get signed up for that um, ASAP so we can plan accordingly. And then lastly, I also sent the registration link for summer camp that's directly through Camp Kobiak. So I know that we did a really good job getting registered through my link so I could uh, communicate with them our numbers, but now we need to directly register with them. So there's a, a couple things, and if it's, if it's a pain that you don't want to deal with, you can bring it to me and we can do it together. Number one, do not pay their, on their website. Do not pay them directly. Click the pay through the church option so that way we can just pay and, and all, all in bulk. Number two is if you have a teen that is currently in sixth grade, not going into sixth grade, but currently in sixth grade right now, I need you to do me a very spiritual favor and lie. You have to lie on that spread, that sign-up sheet because, <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, the reason for that is because our group operates from 6th through 12th grade, and um, a lot of, like, the camps do 7th through 12th grade. And so by the time we take them to camp, they will have completed 6th grade. So as you're registering them, I don't want them to be uh, part of the remnant, you know, over here where we're all moving on to this new program over here. So we want them to come with us to teen camp. Otherwise, they'll be signed up for junior camp, and then we won't know where they're at, what they're doing, or what they're being taught. So if they're in 6th grade... Say they're in seventh, and um, can we cut that? You know, I'm just kidding. So, all right, we'll pray. For, we'll pray for the offering. And uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for uh, this church. We thank you for this time of year as we we look forward to celebrating your resurrection. Um, it's just a, an amazing time that we can utilize to glorify you, glorify the message of the gospel, Lord. Lord, I pray that you can be glorified today in this service uh, with the music, with the message, Lord. But I pray that you can just bless this offering. Bless the gift, bless the giver, and just help it be, be utilized to further your, your, uh, your gospel. In your name I pray. just common flesh and bone but I'll prove someday just why I say I'm of a special kind for when he was on the cross I was on his mind a of love was on his face and thorns were on his head blood was on his scarlet robe it was stained a crimson red though his eyes were on the crowd that day he looked ahead in time he was on the cross, I was on his mind, for he knew me, yet he loved me, he whose glory makes the heavens shine. I'm so unworthy of such mercy, and when he was on the cross, I was on his mind, when he was on the cross, I was on
All right, I appreciate that song and a blessed thought to know. Let's take our Bibles together this morning, if you would, and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings and chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter 18 this morning. And we are going to look at, I think undoubtedly is the most well-known story or event that took place in the life and ministry of the prophet Elijah. And of course, we are in a study now in the life and times of Elijah. And what we're going to be looking at today is the conflict of Carmel. The conflict at Carmel. You know, I think most everyone's heard of the gunfight at the OK Corral. Well, we're going to talk about the God fight at the OK Carmel. And uh, what we're going to try to do this morning is simply uh, get the message that God has for us that's, I think, clearly articulated in this chapter and the story that we have here in chapter number 18. I'm, we're not going to try to find some new deep truth. We're not going to try to contrive something out of the chapter to be sensational, but we are just going to try to be challenged and hopefully encouraged by the obvious message of this chapter. And, um, you know, when we talk about the Old Testament, we understand today we're in the dispensation of grace, and the Old Testament was for a, a different time. But when you think about the Old Testament, you study it, and you look at it, and you, and you want to get the value of it. There are two verses that the Apostle Paul gives us that you ought to always have really kind of combined together in your thinking, where if you'd give me those, I just want to remind you of these, Romans 15, 4, and the Apostle Paul tells us that the things which were written, there in verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime, meaning back in the Old Testament, were written for our what? Now, I want you to notice a word there, were written, what's the next word after written? For. How many of you know the little phrase, all the Bible is not? No. No, all the Bible is not to us, but all of the Bible is for us. Well, he's telling you that right here. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we today, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now, what does he mean by the patience? He's talking about the enduring of the people of God who were faithful with their, in their patience. And he's talking about the comfort of Scripture, meaning how God was there for them in all of their trials and battles and their victories and their defeats. Through the patience and comfort of Scripture, thank God, you and I might have hope that the same God who worked back there will work today for us in the same way. And then if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 11, something somewhat familiar to that, after going through a whole bunch of Old Testament stories, in verse 11, he says, now all these things, back in the Old Testament, happened unto them, what's that next word say? For. All of this Bible is not to us, but it's what? For us. So all those things happened unto them for in samples, um, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so, what is the message of the story that we're going to look at today in this battle at Carmel? Well, it's going to be simply this, folks. It is the call of God's people to the committed life. It is the call of God's people, whether it was back then or whether it is today. It is the call to you and me to live the consecrated life life Up here, over here the consecrated life consecration means to be wholly dedicated to the service of God and so we're going to be talking about making a choice today making a choice about commitment making a choice about consecration you know when you talk about commitment to the Lord it is sometimes often like salvation. How many of you know that salvation is an instantaneous 
act in a moment of time. In other words, you don't grow into salvation. You know, it's not something that you, you know, are just brought along into other than maybe uh, obtaining truth and information. But when you, are, when you are saved and you are regenerated by the power of God and by the work of the Holy Spirit, folks, that is a moment of time, instantaneous act where you are begotten of God. Just like when someone's born, it's a moment of time where they come out and there they are and they've got life. Well, the committed life can be like that too. Now, you can have certainly a, a process of time of growing in your consecration and growing in your commitment to the Lord, but I want to tell you, it can also be an instantaneous act based upon maybe something that God does in your life. Maybe it's some kind of a crisis event that happens to where you say, I've got to get busy and committed to the Lord. Maybe somebody dies and it rocks your world. Maybe you're a, a young couple and you have a child and you've been kind of playing, you know, pussyfoot with the things of the Lord, and now you're saying, hey, I've got to make a decision. I've got a child here. But I remember when Noah, my grandson, was born. I had three kids before that. I appreciated all their births, and I loved most of them. But, uh, <laughs> but when I had, when I had when, when, as an older man, in my age and in my, in my understanding of life and even in the things of God, when I held Noah in my hand, that overwhelming understanding that I've got a soul here and the responsibility of mine to invest myself in, in, this, in this child, in this soul, in this life that's been given to our family. And it was overwhelming to me. Trace will tell you that. I mean, I, I was just overcome with the thought of, of, of life and responsibility and the joy of that brand new baby. And so it might be something along that line. It may be a sermon you hear. Maybe it's the sermon you'll hear today. It might be something that's said to you. How many of you have ever heard of the great D.L. Moody? Let me see your hand. Just about everybody. You probably know the story. Uh, D.L. Moody, one of the greatest evangelists that has ever really come and gone in the history of our country. Uh, Mr. Moody lived back in the 1800s. Um, he died at about 1900. He had about a 40 or 50 year ministry from about 1850 to, to 1900. And uh, D.L. Dwight Lyman Moody, he, he was born in a very poor home. His dad died when he was a little boy and his mom had, it's the same story you hear about all these guys. He had about nine or 10 kids and had to work 20 jobs and all of that to take care of him. And when he was 17 years old living in Boston, he, uh, he worked in his uncle's shoe store, and he had real designs on becoming rich. He wanted to make a lot of money. And his Sunday school teacher visited him one day, and thank God led D.L. Moody to Christ. And a uh, short time after that, uh, Moody moved to Chicago, and God opened up a lot of doors for him in Chicago. He went to Chicago to make money, but yet God was opening doors for opportunities in different ministries. And the Spirit of God continued to capture his heart about the things of the Lord. And, um, and the Lord brought throughout the years some real notable people into the life of D.L. Moody, a, a man named Ira Sankey, who was a great uh, writer of, uh, of uh, hymns and so forth, traveled with him to Britain, to, great, uh, to uh, England many times. And, and uh, also uh, Hudson Taylor, a great missionary to China. And then also uh, another man named... Henry Varley, and Henry Varley was a British theologian, and Mr. Varley one time said to D.L. Moody, he said very simply, he said, he said, Dwight, he said, the world has not seen what God can do with a man, in a man, by a man, and through a man who will wholly dedicate and wholly consecrate himself to the Lord. And that statement pierced Moody's heart to such a place that a short time after that, Moody said, I will be that man. And he committed himself to the Lord in such a way that God used him to shake America and to shake Britain for the gospel's sake. Hallelujah. We've got another man in our study who was wholly given to the Lord, a man named 
Elijah. And Elijah today, in this wonderful story in chapter 18, is going to challenge our hearts about the committed life. Now, before we begin to read here, I want to just get us on the same page very quickly. We know that Israel's battling and dealing with a problem, right? What is Israel, that northern kingdom in particularly, what is Israel's problem? What are they going through historically at this time in their history? They have a real propensity and a very real attraction to what? To idolatry and to idols. And at this point in time, we've already seen that they have a real attraction to uh, the idol Baal, the, the idolat idolatrous system of Baal and Baal's girlfriend. We'll call her his girlfriend, Astrith. I mean, actually, she was his mother slash incestuous wife, Samarimus, who, of course, ultimately gets to heaven. And then we got this whole thing about the queen of, uh, the queen of heaven and all of that, right? We've talked about that. And so they've got all of this issue with idolatry. And that idolatrous system had so come into the nation of Israel that it inundated their kingdom, it inundated their culture, and it had an effect upon just about everybody in that northern kingdom. Now, I think it was, what, maybe two weeks ago, we talked about what is an idol. We talked about what is idolatry. And again, the very simplest definition that people give about idolatry is anything that you put ahead of God. All right? Uh, you know, obviously the Bible says that in all things he's to be preeminent. Um, seek first the kingdom of God. I mean, he's to be, he's to be first, eminent. He's to be only all of that. Right? Anything you put ahead of God is an idol. But we also kind of added to that for the sake of understanding where we're at that an idol is an unauthorized noun, any person, place, or thing that you look to in your life as a source to get something out of that particular thing that you're looking to that will be some kind of sustaining value to who you are and what you are. In other words, you're looking to a source other than God, whether it's a person, place, or thing. To meet a need in your life, to meet the need of whether it's an, an emotional need or a psychological need or a physical need or a spiritual need, an idol is anything that you look to other than God to be a source of getting your needs met. Now, we talked about the fact that around the world today, countries and cultures have uh, obviously, a lot of idolatry going on, and a lot of their idolatry is maybe different than we want to kind of talk about with America. We talk about the fact that all these other countries around the world, oftentimes, you know, they have their they have their uh, their their carved out idols of statues and so forth like that, and they also worship things about the physical creation. I mean, they'll worship things about the earth, and and they'll worship animals, and they'll worship things about. You know, the heavenly bodies up there, the moon, the stars, the, the sun, and so forth. You know, we talk about here in America, you know, we don't do a lot of that, but I'm going to tell you what, we do do some of that. Because I think we mentioned the fact that people like to go to their horoscope and, uh, you know, go to the, uh, uh, the, you know, astrology and all of that. And you know what God says about all of that? He says it's an abomination. It's an abomination. Because you don't go to that as a source to try to figure out the movement of your life. You know, I mean, what's going to happen and, and what's going to come about and, and, and to look to those kind of things because that is an, an authori that's an unauthorized source that you're looking to to get some kind of need met in your life, and God won't have that. Now, in America, you know, we have an idolatry in America, but our, our idolatry, you know, we want to think is, you know, much more sophisticated. It's all based upon what's going on, on in our culture and what's being promoted in our culture and our gravitation to the things that are going on in, in the world and society. You know, whether it's putting an overemphasis on personality or people or power or persuasion or certainly the purse, you know, with the aspect of money. 
But I say to you again this morning, folks, that whatever is something in your life that you're looking to as a source of meeting some need that you have, then you are one who is involved in idolatry. And it's an issue that we have to address. And so if you can be right here, so that means you can be right here this morning, right now, sitting here, all prim and proper on Sunday morning in in church, and yet you can be today an idol worshiper. And it's not that you're not recognizing God, but if he's not the source of everything in your life, then God is simply a point of reference. And he doesn't want to be a point of reference. He wants to be your source. And so let's look at our lesson this morning. Do you have your Bible open to 1 Kings 18? And here in our study and in our story, Elijah and Ahab are going to have another confrontation. They've only had one before, and that happened over three years earlier, where Elijah went to the king with the word of God and told Ahab that there's not going to be any rain except by my word. And of course, we know that that, that, that rain was stayed for a period of over three years. And of course, with that, with that rain being stopped, the heavens being stopped, then a great famine has come into the land, a great dearth. And, uh, you know, the, the people of, of Israel have gone through tremendous hard, hardship. And now God has told Elijah, all right, I want you to go to see Ahab again, and I want you to tell him the rain's coming. Now, notice in your Bible with me, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 18. And it came to pass after many days, that's those three, three and a half years there, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Samaria was the capital city of that northern kingdom. What's the capital city of the southern kingdom? Jerusalem. But that northern kingdom, it it had been at one time Shechem, and then it was moved to Samaria, right there in the middle of that northern kingdom, that northern area. Look look at verse 17 now. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? In other words, Ahab looks at Elijah and he says, You know what? you're still really getting on my nerves. I mean, everything that's going on in our kingdom, all of this difficulty, all of this hurt, all of this hardship, the fact that we haven't had any rain, the fact that we've gone through this terrible dearth and famine, he's trying to put the blame on the man of God. Well, I'm going to tell you this about Elijah, because he was a man of God, He wasn't a politically correct individual. And so what does he say to Ahab, verse 18? And he answered, Elijah answered, he says, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, everybody who's come before you, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Elijah looks at the king and he says, hey, you're the problem, Ahab. You're the one who's troubled your kingdom. The idolatry that you brought in concerning Baal, you and your wife, you and everyone before you. Now, folks, it's pretty obvious, again, that Elijah wasn't worried about the political ramifications of what he had to say. It was all about his business to lay the problem and the blame at the feet of the one who who was to be blamed. And he said, the problem you're having in your nation, the problem you're having with the one true God of heaven is you've rejected him and you've brought in an an idolatrous system, a worship and, and an acknowledgement of Balaam or Baal and the Baal system. And it's because of that that the the culture of your kingdom is in big trouble because you have pursued another God. 
You know, when I think about that this morning, you know, I, I think about our country. You know, and, and it seems like we're saying this about all the time anymore, but, you know, this whole mess we're in today, everything going on in society, all the trouble out there. Folks, you can mark it up that the primary reason that this is taking place is because our nation has gotten to a place where we are rejecting the one true God of heaven. And he's being replaced in our country, our culture, our society with every other kind of God that you can mention. You know what we have today? We have the God of evolution. We have the God of materialism. We have the God of perversion. We have the God of, of hedonism. We have the God of heathenism. We have the God of situation ethics. I mean, you can go on and on and on down the line, but the problem with America is that we've said, God, we don't want you anymore. We're not looking to you anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And you know what God is saying? God is saying to America, okay, well, then let me get out of the way and let me show you what life will be like if you don't want me to be your God. You go ahead and remove me. And, of course, that's what we, we've been trying to do. And when I say we, you know what I mean by that. I mean, he's been removed from the public school. He's being removed from government. God is being removed from the very basic definition of what marriage ought to be about. Uh, he's, he's being removed from even fun things, athletics. I mean, you can't in some places even pray before a football game and acknowledge the one God of heaven. I've been asked along the way to, to maybe say a prayer as a pastor, uh, as, a, as a beginning of, of something. And, and, and they've said, well, listen, when you pray, we don't want you to pray in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, honey, you got the wrong man. But they want to remove the name of God and take him out of our culture and our society. And that means, folks, when God is removed, listen to me, when God is removed, you know what you got? You got a vacuum. And something's going to have to fill that vacuum. And, of course, there's only God and the enemy. And what the enemy's going to do is he's going to fill that vacuum with idolatry and the consequences, folks, of having an idolatrous system are all around us today. And that's exactly what was going on in Israel. That was what was happening in uh, Elijah's day and, and Ahab's day that they had taken God out and they took out his promised blessings because they were not acknowledging him. Well, look at verse number 19 real quick. Elijah says to Ahab, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. Here you go. Here's the uh, gunfight at the OK Corral. Let's meet there. Carmel. And he says, Bring the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400. So that's 850. Which eat at Jezebel's table. And so what you have here is that scattered throughout all of Israel were these 450 prophets of Baal. But also you have what were called the groves. We've talked about the groves. The groves were built around uh, the, the capital city and, and the royal city and so forth, just on the outskirts of Samaria and Shechem. And in those groves, they had trees, and they had flowers, and they had bushes. And it was just, a, no doubt, a very beautiful uh, thing to see. And, and they had idols set up in there. And I'm going to tell you what else they did. They did a lot of ungodly, wicked, immoral things in those groves that took place. All of the idolatry and sexual abomination that goes along with idolatry. Those things were conducted in the groves. And those groves held a very special place to Ahab and to Jezebel, but in particularly to Jezebel. And these 400 priests of the groves were some, were, were some that she really 
looked after. It says here that they ate at her table, meaning, of course, there had been a famine. People were having a hard time finding food. And Jezebel was giving a certain favored treatment to these 400 prophets who worked in these groves and, and ministered in these groves. And so, verse number 20. And so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and he gathered the prophets together unto Carmel, and now we got this meeting. You know, Elijah said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get all the people of Israel. I mean, what a multitude. And I want you to get all the prophets, and I want you to come, and we're going to have a showdown. We're going to put this thing on the table. We're going to put it to rest. We're going to prove who is God and who's not God. There's not going to be any ambiguity. We're going to settle this thing once for all. And so Ahab sends out messengers throughout his kingdom for the people to come to Carmel. And as you read the story, we understand only 450 of the 850 prophets show up. These other 400 don't come. Now, I don't know why. The Bible doesn't tell us, and it's all speculation, I imagine. But I'll give you one of two reasons. Number one, they looked at that thing and said, uh-uh. No, we know too much about this man, Elijah. We know too much about his God, and this isn't going to end well. And so they didn't go. And I'm going to tell you this, you're going to see it. If you read this story the way I read it, those 450 prophets of Baal, they didn't want to be there either. They didn't want any part of this. But those 400 didn't come either because they didn't want to or because Jezebel, because she had a special affinity to that 400, she didn't allow them to go. But what we do know is that Ahab, the people, and these 450 prophets show up. And you know what, Ahab, you know what Elijah said? My name means, what's Elijah mean? The Lord is my God. And Elijah said, I'm going to be there. Me and my God. Look at verse 21. And here's where it really starts kind of ramping up right here in verse 21. And here's a rhetorical question that makes this story so well known. Verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And look at this. And the people answered him, not a word. Now, you know what? I can never read that. Come up here with me. I can never read that if the Lord be God. Why halt you between two opinions? My mind immediately goes to several places throughout the word of God where God or the Lord is always giving a binary choice to people. Does your mind go to Joshua with me with this? How many of you went to Joshua? Joshua chapter 24, verse, verse 15, right? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Make a commitment today. Come to a place of consecration today. And as Joshua challenged the people in Joshua cha chapter 24, he challenged them against Baal. He said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve those gods who were on the other side of the flood? Or are you going to serve those gods who are here in the land, the gods of the Amorites, uh, these people that you've come in and you've, you have, uh, uh, you've taken over? Are you going to follow those gods? And you know what gods these were and these were? Baal. They had a lot of different names. But it was the same one God and the same one system. Remember why they have all those different names? Because of what happened at the Tower of Babel. And God sent them out. And they were spread out with different languages, different tongues. And so they all had the same God, but they were now developing different names and different religious structures that all fell under this one system of Baal. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, what are we going to do? We're going to serve the Lord. Amen? I think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. 
No man can serve what? Two masters. He'll love the one and hate the other. He'll, he'll hold to the one and he'll despise the other. You can't serve two. Over in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, you know what Christ said? He that is not with me is against me. That's a pretty categorically clear statement. You're either with him or you're against him. Get him. James said in James 1.8, a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. John sees those seven churches in that last church, Laodicea. You know what God said about that church? He said, you make me sick because you're not hot or cold. You know what they were? Right here. They were lukewarm. They were halting. They were halting between two opinions. You know, when I read that, you know, that word halt, it has the idea of hesitating. It has the idea of vacillating. When I read that, in my mind, I see that here they come, and they come to a fork in the road. One way is wrong, one way is right. One way is bail, and one way is the things of God Almighty. I don't know about you, but if I came to that place, a fork in the road, I'm not going to stop and try to decide. Man, I'm just going to go right to my right and boogie on. Amen? Amen. But he's challenging them. Why hold she between two opinions? If the Lord be God. Now, what does that mean about the Lord being God? Well, what is God, folks? <laughs> God is the creator. If the Lord be your God, he created you. And let me tell you what also God is. God is a savior. Over in the book of Titus, give me, give me Titus, uh, give me Titus 1.3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me. Paul, according to the commandment of God our what? God our Savior. Look at, uh, look at chapter 3, verse 4. Titus. But after that, the kindness and love of God, what? Our Savior. Why hold you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, if he's your creator, if he's your Savior, if he's your sustainer, if he's your supplier, if he's your Suckerer, meaning your helper, if he is your security, if he's your judge, and one day you're going to have to stand and give an account of him as either a believer or an unbeliever, but if God's all of that, then what are you hesitating about? What are you hesitating about? And they answered him not a word. Let me ask you tonight, or this morning, folks, if the Lord be God, what are you hesitating about? In making an absolute and total commitment and consecration of your life to the Lord and the things of the Lord, what are you halting about? Why are you double dealing here? Why do you have this dualism? How long? What's it going to take? How many months? How many years? How many sermons do you have to hear about commitment before you make that commitment to the Lord? Well, I don't mind going to the bar on Saturday night then coming to church on Sunday. Oh, how long? I'll go to the casino on Tuesday. I don't mind worshiping Baal on Tuesday night, but then Wednesday night, I'll go to the prayer meeting. I'll go out on Friday night, Saturday night, tip one back, get me a bottle of Jack, then I'll go to church on Sunday night and enjoy the Lord's Supper. How long? Hold you between two opinions. I'll wear my modest clothing and try to represent myself as a Christian on Sunday, but then through the week I'll 
I'll dress like a harlot. If you ever wonder if you're dressing like a harlot, come and see me. I'll help you with that. Because I know what that looks like. And I'm saying that even to men as well. How long halts you between two opinions? Well, preacher, you know, no, let's don't get too serious about this now. You know, I want a little sermon, a little music, a, a little message, a, you know, a little time with the people there. But, but, you know, don't put this on me too hard now. Mm -hmm. That's why it says at the end of this verse, and they answered him not a word. Let me tell you why they didn't answer him. Number one, because they were convicted. Number two, because there was no argument to that. I mean, how can you argue against that? There's God and there's Baal. There's God and there's the devil. Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to be committed to in your life? How are you going to argue against that? And number three, they didn't answer a word because they hadn't yet made the choice of what they were going to do. And so it got very quiet. I understand the conviction part. I've noticed through the years when I preach, if I'm really, you know, kind of meddling and kind of hitting real personal stuff, it gets real quiet. <laughs> they answer him not a word. Ain't too many amens. Ain't too many hallelujahs. Ain't too many glories. I get up here and I preach some kind of informational message about some wonderful things in the Word of God, and I'll get phone calls the next week. Preach a great message on. But if I bear down, my phone is quiet. And they, they, they answered him not a word. Well, we got to go on here. Amen. What am I doing already? Who, who's? Amen. Here we go. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, I, I love this verse, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And so Elijah looks and he says, hey, here's the odds, 450 against one. And I'm going to beat you at Carmel, but I got news for you, my name is Elijah. What's Elijah mean? The Lord is my God. And so he says, I'm not going to Carmel to kind of see how the odds are going to play out. Because I already know what they are. 450 against one. But I have committed myself wholly unto the Lord. And I'm ready to go to Carmel to make my stand. Hallelujah. We sang the song earlier, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross. Listen, folks, we're living in a time, in a, in a society, in a country, in a culture, where just about everything is against us today. And God needs some Christians to take a stand when all the numbers are against you. When your family numbers are against you, you need to take a stand. When the numbers are against you at school, young people, which is every day, you got to take a stand. When the numbers are against you at work, and by the way, let me say this, when the numbers are against you, even in the sphere of Christianity and the body of Christ, you've got to take a stand. You've got to take a stand on the right book. You've got to take a stand on what that book teaches, how it teaches it, and how to live based upon how that book is taught. Amen. Take a stand. The Apostle Paul said, stand fast in the faith. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. Why? So you can stand in the evil day. That evil day, folks, is a day where you're just facing trouble. That's what evil means in the Bible, trouble. Trouble, calamity. We got trouble and calamity out there. Somebody needs to stand. God's looking for somebody to stand in the gap. God's looking for someone to take a stand. And Elijah said, I'm that man. He didn't know what God had reserved over here. He just looked at what he saw. He was the only one. He was the only one. 
I've been to preacher meetings before. Well, knowing my Bible, this book the way I believe it to be the Word of God and rightly divided, sitting in a room full of preachers, knowing that I'm the only one there who understand Paul as our apostle, understanding the mystery, understanding the grace of God, understanding God's program for today, understanding who and what God's doing. Sometimes you just have to take a stand. Look at verse 23. He says, let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And call ye, notice ye, he's talking to the, he's talking to the people. He says, call ye on the name of your gods. Notice gods, plural, but we're talking about one God. Who's the one God? Baal, but you got all these gods under that. And call ye on the name of, the, of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire let him be God. Now look at what the people say. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. <laughs> you know why they thought, thought that? Because they thought, well, okay, you just, came into our, you, you just came into our sweet spot. See, he says, we're going to do a thing with fire. Remember in our study about Baal? Baal goes back to whom? Nimrod. And when Nimrod died... His mother wife proclaimed him to be Baal and associated him with the sun, and he becomes a sun god. You see what Elijah's doing, folks, is he's hitting, he's hitting them right at the strength of their God. Because if anybody could send fire, if anybody could light that thing up, it'd be Baal. Because he's he's up there associated with the sun. And so Elijah said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And he said that to the people. See, he's talked to Ahab, and he's talked to the people, but guess what? Look up here. He hadn't talked to the 450 prophets of Baal. Those guys are just sitting over here hanging out thinking, what's going to happen? Verse number 25. So now he addresses the prophets. Of course, the people said, let's do this thing. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they uh, dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal. Notice they're calling here. Notice that phrase. And they called on the name of Baal from morning. Now, what does that mean? Nine o'clock, eight o'clock, seven o'clock. But we got to say from at the, at, the, at the most nine, but probably six or seven in the morning. And they're doing this thing, watch, uh, until, until noon, until 12, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar, which was made. Now, folks, I want you to think about that. Think about how long that went. I mean, you know, maybe the minimum of three hours, but probably four or five hours. And they're just going around saying, Baal, help us, Baal. Send fire. Oh, Baal, where are you? Oh, Baal, uh, light this thing up. Oh, Baal, uh, we honor you. We worship you. Oh, Baal, help. And and this thing went on. And and not just one God, 450 I mean, that would be this crowd and a half size more people. And and, and they've made an altar and they're going through all these histrionics of jumping up on the altar and they're trying to do whatever they can do. I'm telling you this, for them to get out of this fix. I'm telling you, they did not want to be there. And they have to do this now for and five hours crying out to a, a God that they knew inherently within themselves was no God. You know what the Apostle Paul said about idols? He says, now we know that an idol is nothing in the world. 
It's nothing. It's a statue. What was Baal? Baal was, a, was, a, was a, the head of a bull with horns on a man's body. That's what Baal was. A statue. A carved out idol that was nothing in the world except for this, de, 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 this system of deception that Satan had developed it around, uh, that he, he had developed around the idea of this, of this bowl. Well, here's where it kind of gets funny, isn't it? Verse number 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Now, again, folks, uh, you know, you got 450, and you're in their, air, you're in their territory, right? I mean, you're in their neighborhood. You're in their hood. I mean, you're down there where they hang out and where they do their thing. It doesn't seem reasonable that one guy is going to make fun of him. But you know what? Elijah's been over here just kind of minding his own business. He's not tired at all. He hadn't been yelling around for three, four, five hours. And now he mocks them. I hope you can appreciate that. I, I can appreciate that. Well, okay. I, I don't leave that alone. But, but Elijah, and look at what he said to him. He said, now look what he says. He says, cry aloud, for he is a God. You know, up in verse number 26, they are saying, they're not crying out. But now, but now you know what Elijah says? You need to cry aloud. You're not talking loud enough. They've been doing this for four or five hours. And Elijah comes and says, hey, you got to lift up your voice. Because he is a God. You're telling me he's a God. If he's a God, he can hear. So you need to lift up. You need to be louder to get his attention. To come into his hearing, cry aloud. Why, Elijah? Because either he is talking, so he's having maybe another conversation with somebody else, or maybe he's on his cell phone, <laughs> and he can't really, you know, hit the little button, uh, can I call you later? I love that little button. <laughs> or, or he is pursuing, you know, meaning... Uh, you know, maybe, you know, you're his enemy, but maybe he's got some other enemies over here and he's pursuing some other enemies. Or maybe he's out hunting and he's pursuing a fox or he's pursuing some kind of animal. And so you need to keep trying to get his attention. Yell louder. So wherever he's out, out there pursuing, he'll be able to hear you. Or maybe he is in a journey. Maybe he's on a business trip. Maybe he's taking a vacation. He's on a journey, or per adventure, he sleepeth and must be awaked. Now, of course, that would stand in complete contrast to what the Bible says about the Lord God of Israel, how he neither what? Slumbers nor sleeps. The only time God slept was when God became a man, so he could understand what sleep is. Now, he could define sleep, but he never slept before. You understand, folks, the personality of our God? Amen. In the Old Testament, he didn't know temptation. In the Old Testament, he didn't know what it was to be hungry. God, God had never hungered. He didn't know what it was to be uh, uh, sad in the sense of, uh, you know, the, the emotions that Christ displayed in his humanity. That's why the Bible says when Jesus Christ came as a man, that he was made perfect. Back here, God was not complete. How about that thought? He was not complete. Not until he took upon himself flesh. And he entered in. To everything that we go through so that he could be a faithful high priest to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, real quick, verse 28. And so what do they do? Well, Elijah got their attention in verse 28. He actually kind of probably made them a little mad. In verse 28, and they cried aloud, because what did he tell them in verse 27? Cry aloud. And so they cry aloud, and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets. 
till the blood gushed out upon them. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get God's attention. We talked in our Baal series about this matter of penance. How religions around the world and even some that would be called Christian religions practice a, 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 a demonstration of contrition and their own personal try for redemption. And they call it penance. Putting themselves through pain and hurt and agony to somehow do something to get God's attention and to show that they mean business and to show that they're sorry for their sin and they know that that sin needs to be paid for and they're trying to do their part. And so they do these things to themselves. And then verse 29, And it came to pass when midday was passed and they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. So the queen of heaven isn't helping. Baal's not helping. Again, an idol is nothing in the world. And so there was no voice, no answer from Baal, no regard to their petition, no regard to their histrionics, no regard to what they did in hurting themselves. Now look at what Elijah does. We're just about done. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. I like that. You ever heard me say, come up here? Come near unto me. Amen. And Elijah said, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was what? Broken down. Now I want you to see that, folks, because that's very important to the story. They're up here at Mount Carmel, this mountain, this mountainous range that goes from the Mediterranean Sea all the way over to the Jordan River. And I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a thing called Mount Carmel, and it's all this. And on that mount, there had been a, an altar that had been built to the Lord previously. When they were recognizing at one point the one true God of heaven. But now that altar is broken down. Why? Because it's been ignored. Because it's, it's been cast off. It's not being attended to. And why is that crucial to understand? Look up here. Because what is an altar about? An altar is about worship. It's about sacrifice. And now what you do with an altar? Altar, you sacrifice. Well, why do you sacrifice on an altar? You sacrifice on an altar to deal with what? Your sins. The nation of Israel got into the place where, uh-uh, we don't want accountability anymore. We don't want to deal with our sins anymore. We want to cast that off. And you know what Baal did? As long as they recognized him wearing his long robes and phylactery, all of these different things that he did, all of that, all of that minutia of that religion, Baal let them do what they want to do. They could live the way they wanted to live. They could act like they want, the way they wanted to act. They could be immoral. They could be ungodly. They could have their religion but no reality. Of course, that's what religion is. Religion is that which has no reality to it. And so, Elijah comes to that altar, and he repairs that altar. And then look at uh, verse number 31. And Elijah took how many stones? Twelve. Now, 12 is associated with what people? The people of Israel, right? 12 tribes. He takes 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Why does he take 12 stones? Because who was in a covenant marital relationship with the Lord? It was Israel. Those 12 tribes. How many of you, when you read about those stones, does your mind go anywhere else? Does your mind maybe go back with me to the book of Joshua? When they crossed over the Jordan, and as they did, they, they put those memorials up of those 12 stones. And why did they do that? Because Joshua said, in the generations to come, when the people forget 
When your children forget and your children's children forget and they come and they say, what are these stones? Then you can tell them, the Lord God of heaven is our God. And he brought us through. He saw us through. He met the need. He provided the miracle. And those stones of those memorials were a reminder. And so Elijah gathers 12 stones because he's trying to bring the people of Israel back to a remembrance of their relationship with their God, a covenant relationship, a marital relationship that they've been unfaithful to. Because what have they been doing? They've been going after other gods. And so he gets these 12 stones. He makes an altar. Verse, uh, verse 32, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now, this, this trench, self-explanatory as, this, as the story goes on here. Let's just read it because we're, we're, we are running out of time. Verse 33, and he put the wood in order. Now, that's an interesting little thing to say. Put the wood in order. Now, well, why did he do that? Because you know what kind of God we have, beloved? We got a God of what? Of order. You ever look out into the heavens and see the order? The Bible says that all things be done how? Decently and, and in what? In order. And so he takes these, this wood, puts it in order. He cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt offering. Well, the offering was on top, right? So that's easy to understand. And on the wood, the wood was on top. So he's got this altar of these stones. He's got these, he's got these 12 stones and he's built this altar. And on the top, they've laid the wood in order. They put the bullock on top. And then they get these four containers of water and they pour them on top. And of course, it runs down over the, over the animal. It runs down over the wood. It runs down over the stone. And then it eventually runs out into the what? Into that trench that was dug around the altar. But he didn't just do it one time, did he? Verse number 34. And, and again, folks, think about that. You know, what, you, know what, you know what Elijah's doing? He's trying to make it hard on God. He's trying to make this thing as hard as he could on the Lord so God could do what? Prove himself strong. And so he says, Four times do this. I mean, four pictures, but he, do, he says, do it again. What? Verse number 34. He said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the what? The third time. Three times four is what? Twelve. You got a number 12 again. This 12 here answers to the 12 stones. You know why? Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 19, in the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. And so God has given a witness to his call to the people to come back to him in, his, in the covenant relationship with him and to be fully consecrated and committed to the Lord God of heaven. And so 12 pictures. And again, you know, if you're trying to start a fire, you want things as dry as they can be so they can be combustible. But he has soaked this thing down and with all 12 of these containers of water, of course, it's all gone down, but it's all been caught in that trench around the altar. Nothing wasted. And verse 35, and the water ran round about the, uh, the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. See, there's that covenant statement that he's in a relationship with them in. I, Abraham, Isaac, Israel, that's Jacob. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, God, show and prove to this crowd that I have lived in my life a committed life, a consecrated life. My name is Elijah. The Lord is my God. 
And I want you to show these people what you can do and what you will do for a person who is wholly committed to you. I've kept your word. It always gets back to the word of God, doesn't it? It always gets back to the authority of what God said. And so Elijah's standing there and he's praying. All of the people are there. 450 prophets of Baal. Ahab is there. And now he says, God, honor me, honor yourself, and honor your word. Because you know what he's trying to do? Come up here. He's trying to get this crowd back to a place of commitment. That's why he said to Ahab, when we meet at Carmel, get them all there. Go out, rally your troops, bring them to Carmel. Because he wants them to make a decision to be consecrated back to God. That's why he builds an altar. The altar was going to be a place of the, 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 the reality. It, listen, folks, there has to be... There has to be, first and foremost, in your life and mine, spiritual priorities. That's why he built that altar. That's why he called them to the altar. Because the altar is a place of spiritual priority, spiritual requirement. And I'm going to tell you what, folks, if we don't have spiritual priorities at Midland Baptist Church, we've got nothing. That always has to be first. We could well, preach a whole sermon there. All right, verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their back, uh, thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering, the animal, and the wood that was put in order. And have you ever noticed? And the stones. Those big old 12 stones, man, the fire burned them up. But not just the stones. And licked up the water that was in the trench. You know, Elijah was just wanting the, wanting the sacrifice to be burned. You know, what that, you know what that answers to? That answers to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we are able to ask or think. Amen. Elijah said, let the fire fall and consume the sacrifice. And God said, I'll do better than that. I'm going to show off. <laughs> Listen, folks, if you live a committed life, if you live a consecrated life, you know what God will, God will like to do with it? He'll like to show off and show up on your account. He likes to be proud of his children. Amen. He likes to show off the trophies of his grace and what he's done in your life and mine. And so the fire falls and the stones are burned. And then the Lord said, take that little fire. And that fire and, and, the, and the flames of that fire like a tongue going around licking up that water. I am the Lord and beside me there is none else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Baal, what is Baal? Nothing but a statue. No truth, no reality, no hope. So sad, so sad that Christianity is inundated with the influence of Baal. Well, look at what his testimony brought. Look at the next verse and we're done. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That was the influence. That was the influence that a man who was fully committed and consecrated to God could have. All of these people, the Lord, he's God. And, of course, you know what he goes on to do. He grabs those 450 and uh, you're toast. I was thinking about this this week. I heard somebody else talk about it, too. And you all know what a, uh, a hillbilly bump in the road is? You know, I was born and reared down in southern Ohio on the Ohio River. 
know, we got a tri-city area here with uh, obviously Midland Beach City and Saginaw and down where I was born and reared, it was a tri-state area, tri-city, tri-state area with Ironton, Ohio, Huntington, West Virginia, Ashland, Kentucky, right on the river. And, uh, and hillbilly country to be sure. And the, uh, you know, they, they, they had a thing down there that they called hillbilly road bumps. You know what that was? It was armadillos. Thousands of them. Every year, killed. I've never seen a live armadillo, but I've seen hundreds of them laying on their back with their feet up in the air and they're all squashed. Right in the middle of the road. They get, they get crossing over the road with the cars coming and they get to the middle of the road and they stop because no doubt the warmth of the asphalt, but they stop in the middle of the road and they don't go all the way over. And you know what happens, man. You get a bunch of hillbilly rednecks out there in the, driving on the roads, man. I never hit one. I never did it. But they're called hillbilly road bumps because you know why? They got comfortable when they got to the middle of the road and they didn't go on over. You know, I, I got to kind of wonder how many hillbilly road bump Christians we have in here tonight, today. That you're kind of playing in the middle, you're right in the middle, you find some warmth there, some comfort, but you've never gone over to the other side. And when the glory of God comes running down the middle of that road, folks, you get run over by it. Rather than to bask in it and to magnify the Lord and who he is and what he's done in your life. And I'm telling you what God's looking for this morning. He's looking for some people to go over to the other side, to go all the way over and to be fully committed and to be fully consecrated to the Lord. Choose you this day. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Amen? He's your God. He's your Lord. Father, we thank you for the study this morning. We thank you for this story, and we thank you for Elijah. Father, I pray that you would help, help us all today to be challenged, encouraged, to be sober about the truth of this story. Lord, it was true then, it's true now. You're looking for God's people who will not hesitate, who will not vacillate back and forth between the things of God, the things of the world, between the things of God, the things of Baal, between the truth and the lie. But to go on over to the other side, all the way over, not to get comfortable in the middle of the road and say, I've got all I want, i got all I need, and don't bother me, leave me alone. Lord, I help, hope, I pray that you haven't left anyone alone here. Speak to hearts, I pray. How many would say with an uplifted hand, Pastor, I needed that today. I really did need that challenge in my life as a Christian. Here's my hand all over the room. Well, I appreciate that. So many, many hands. Let's stand together for a moment. We don't have church tonight, so we'll take another couple of minutes to have an invitation. There's no coming back tonight. Many of you raised hands. How about you coming this morning? Why don't you make that step? Faith and obedience. You know, when Elijah said, how long will you between two opinions? Let me tell you, that was the voice of God coming from the prophet. Because remember, that's what the prophet was. The prophet was the, he was the voice of God. So that's God's challenge. It's not my challenge. It wasn't Elijah's challenge. It was God's challenge. How long halt you? These have come today. These have come today. How about you? I surrender all. Don't be a hillbilly road bump. Go on all the way over. Find safety on the other side. We invite you to come this morning. Would you come? 
Would you come? Coming forward at the invitation time this morning is uh, Elena Everson. How long have you been visiting us now? About three, four months, five months? Okay. And of course, uh, everyone knows Elena. This has been an Amanda Everson's daughter and traveled with them through all the years and was here through all the years with them singing with the brothers until one by one. I know Ben and Amanda are watching. I think they're watching out on the uh, West Coast. They said they wanted to tune in today and uh, see Elena join the church this morning, so we say hi to the Eversons. And Elena's coming today requesting membership into our church. She's been visiting here, and she believes the Lord would have her here to be a part of our church family. I'm excited about that. And so if you join with me to welcome Elena Everson into our church family, would you acknowledge that this morning with a big amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Elena, we welcome you this morning. Won't you stand right here? As we dismiss, many of you come on up and extend a right hand of fellowship to Elena. And let her know that you're glad she joined us today. And Ben and Amanda, we're glad to have you with us today. Send your offering, by the way, if you watch today. <laughs> Send your offering. All right, let's close in prayer. Brother Frank Powers, would you close us? Just as